Hey, I think we are live. We rolling? Uh, we're rolling. So I guess we should just get going. Let's get going. Oh yeah. Okay. This will be quite fun. Let's do uh, it. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, That's more do, normal. I'm gonna do it. Yeah. It's more <laughs> normal, right? Okay. Welcome back. Are we? Are we looking? Part two. Uh, you can at some point if you want. Okay. I feel like I'm not gonna look most of the time. Okay. I'll just look but, at you. Uh, yeah. I'm joined by Frankie. You probably know her from Max Seal or Chris Farron, the project, not the person, or yep. the person. Or the person. Um, or Claude. Yeah. Sure. Pretty good credits right there. <laughs> um, and so we're going to dive into quite a few things, just talking about how legendary you are. And I actually <laughs> am really excited for this because I feel like most of the time that we've been hanging out recently has been in like practicing for joe fist when we played that was that a fun together. show it was super fun yeah but it was like uh we're hang we've been hanging out in situations where i don't want to just interview you for an hour <laughs> while we're all hanging out and so this is the perfect opportunity to get to rattle off questions that i've just had as a friend because well, you've i'd love to answer them hell yeah uh <laughs> yeah you've just had so many seemingly amazing experiences in the last year especially yeah the last two that, years have been crazy uh that i'm really looking forward to diving into quite a few of them but uh how about we start with the timeliest or i guess there's two timely ones because okay i mean you're coming off of a gig with max Seal. you were on stage probably uh 30 45 minutes ago yeah um at the sinclair with the movie life and piebald so that was cool mm -hmm. uh plenty cooking in the max seal camp but uh also the chris farron album dropped today dropped today congrats thanks uh and this is your first release with the project yeah chris has never played with the drummer before um and we did a tour together in 2018 or 2019 um with and retirement party and it was so we did one before that one with free throw oh, okay, um yeah. that's where we met and we kind of forced ourselves into chris's life we were like you know what we're gonna be friends uh -huh. um and then we convinced him to take us out on his headline tour a couple months after that with retirement party okay um and during like peak covid chris and that's when we got the like we became best friends. Okay. Uh, we FaceTimed every day for like seven hours. Um, and at one point he was like, hey, do you want to like write my next album with me? And I was like, okay, sure. Easy enough to say yeah. to that. And, and we did, and it was so fun, and it came out today. We recorded it with uh, Melina, who's uh, JSOM. Uh -huh. uh, she produced it, and I think it's great. I think it's Chris's best album. That's and awesome. not just because I was involved in it. Yeah, but no doubt that that is going to add a nice layer to it. Yeah, uh, and we're playing together live, so uh -huh. that'll be a nice new element to his set. Um, and I feel like having someone to play with makes performing so much more fun. Mm -hmm. So I'm helping him be a better musician. I love that. <laughs> I, and there's no doubt in my mind that's true. And... Uh, I'm really excited to see because if anyone's seen his solo set, he always has a uh, very creative oh, yeah. elements to like the videos he's playing in the backdrop and totally. stuff. And so I'm interested to see how he incorporates uh, a drummer into this. Yeah. I mean, and, it's already epic enough and now it's just going to be overly epic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, how, how was it? Like, I know um, you mentioned that like Jason produced the record and then mm -hmm. Jeff. Jeff played bass and, uh, it sax on some songs okay I yeah mean, that to me sounds like an amazing opportunity to uh, so there's one song specifically that we did i think it's the second track on the record it's called all we ever uh and jeff showed up and was like i'm gonna play bass on this song and he started doing this crazy thing and i was like oh my god that's so sick but you should do it after you play some bass chords and he was like bass chords like that's fucking crazy and i was like try it and then he did, and we made this, like, whole outro that was based around this, like, melody that he was playing on a bass. And it's my favorite. That moment is my favorite moment on the whole album. That's awesome. It's, it was a dream. It was that, so fun. That is very cool. Yeah. And now we're playing our Philly shows just so happened to be on the same day. So we merged gigs. So there's going to be, a f I think, four or five band show 
Jeff is headlining, and then Chris is going to play before him, and then all of our support bands are going to go before. Damn, that's awesome. And that's at the Fillmore? I it's think. at the Fillmore. That's, yeah, you know I, your stuff. I, I, listen, <laughs> I, uh, I, even if my uh, Jeff and Chris, uh, my peak fandom might have been uh, like A couple years in ago. my early 20s, yeah. but I uh, keep tabs. Sure. And so that is going to be an amazing it's going mean, to be talk so about fun. A total bucket list uh, venue, but mm. at this point, uh, a Fillmore is like a, a DIY space to use. Sure. So, <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, um, I guess uh, that is a great segue into some of uh, the other stuff I want to talk to you about uh, touring with Claude over sure. the last year. Yeah, um, let's break it down. Yeah. So the first time I saw you, I think it was probably the only time I actually saw you play. Mm-hmm. You were on tour opening for Phoebe Bridgers. Yeah. And it was uh, in Portland, Maine, at this outdoor. Was it Thompson's? Thompson's, Thompson's something. Yeah, Thompson's Lake or something. Uh, yeah, some shit yeah, like yeah. that. It was something where <laughs> they could bring twelve thousand fans. Yeah. To an. It was a beautiful stage. venue. It was like there was a little creek or something. Yeah. Like people. It's a great spot. Came up on a kayak. I and think just some people did. And like. Yeah. That's that's genius, um, but. That like blew my mind because it was the first time that a friend I'm watching a friend on a stage like that. So what was it like to go into into a tour like that? It was I mean, it was kind of crazy. They definitely were the biggest shows that I had played at that point. Um, But it was also crazy because like five years ago, I saw Phoebe at the Sinclair. Mm -hmm. So it was like crazy for myself but also crazy to see someone who was playing all these venues that i'm used to playing have like evolved into this like huge world that i can't even comprehend um but i feel like at a certain point you don't really even realize how many people you're playing to um and especially as an opener like a lot of people are just vibing no one's really like oh my god she messed up like they're not they don't know the songs enough to know whether or not you mess up unless you like really mess up so you can just have fun so you can just have fun which is what i kind of was doing Uh um and you know people are just so excited to see bands because phoebe's fan base is pretty young and after covid it's a lot of their first shows ever yeah so they're just like and as you're the hyped. opening band yeah. at the first show. So yeah. the, you're the first live band they're ever seen. Exactly. Before. So it's kind of like a, a special feeling. And like a lot of the like kids on the barricade are like had been like camped out for like 18 hours or something wow. crazy um, and are just literally so excited to see anything. That is really another another level of, of fandom. And yeah. so were, were there any other like standout venues or anything on that tour where it was like um just insane amphitheaters i guess yeah i mean most of them were outside which was fun uh i'm trying to remember where that where those shows even hit but was that the tour where you hit radio city music hall that was opening for bleachers oh um so it was a different tour i think a couple months prior Uh um which that was i mean growing up in new york that's like a dream yeah i feel Um, like short of msg like yeah what else i mean I, I mean, obviously playing MSG is, like, iconic, but, like, playing Radio City, like, you don't, you don't start playing drums and be like, oh, one day I'm going to end up playing at Radio City. You're just like, how did this happen? Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a, a kind of crazy moment because when I was a kid, I really wanted to play drums, and my mom was like, no, you're not getting drums. Like, you're going to do what something that's not that loud. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I asked for, like, years and years... And then for my fifth birthday, my uncle and my aunt were like, I'm sick of hearing her ask for drums. We're getting them. And I got them for my birthday. And my uncle was like, I was like, oh, thank you. Thank you. Like, oh, my God, this is the coolest thing ever. And my uncle was like, don't thank me. Just when you play at Radio City, just get me a ticket. So then like 20 years later to be able to be like, You coming or what? I got you a ticket. It's like kind of like this crazy full circle moment. Absolutely. I I have chills right now just hearing that. It was it was wild. An awesome thing to do. And that that spot was crazy because it's like so tall Mm -hmm. and it's so dark in there that it feels like you're playing to an empty room. So it's like weird Mm -hmm. because you're like especially like Max Eel shows, which is one I'm 
primarily used to, there's like rowdy kids. So it's like everyone's just like sitting there just like watching. I'm like, do you guys like it yeah. <laughs> or what? But it was crazy. Yeah, that was probably the most iconic venue that I've played in my life. Uh -huh. um, but on the Phoebe tour, I th I think Thompson's, oh, it's Thompson Thompson's, Thompson's Point. Point. Thompson's That's the name Point. of it. Nice. Um, I think that venue, uh, I mean, it's the only one I can remember playing at. So I mm -hmm. feel like that's probably was the best venue on the tour. Okay. I also don't get to play in yeah. Maine a lot, so yeah. I feel like that was kind of like a C market tour. It yeah, felt like like there wasn't like Boston. Definitely, there was um, a Toronto York, show. Or... Oh, that's, that's um, true. which that must have been pretty huge. Yeah, it was. So we played at this venue. It's called the Budweiser Stage. Um, and there's a small stage outside, and then there's like an amphitheater where like bigger shows roll through. Mm -hmm. Um, and I played the smaller s spot, which is still like. 6,000 cap mm -hmm. um, with Phoebe and then in June I played the bigger room with Boy Genius okay. so even getting to like level up with opening for Phoebe and like to, you know, different variation okay. is that, like crazy <laughs> yeah no that is actually wild and I I was trying to do you know my research before because sure. I, like, I know you've done all these tours and I didn't even catch that there was a boy genius. Yeah, tour it, was, it was only it two shows that we okay. did with them. We did Pittsburgh and then Toronto, but it's just that is insane. it's wild. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah, that that's super cool. Uh, but we haven't even touched on the best of the best yet. You Laying got to on open me. with Paramore. Open yeah, for Paramore. Yeah, that I mean, I watched a video of Haley Williams singing you Happy Birthday. <laughs> yeah, uh, so. What was, I mean, what, the vibe seemed incredible on that tour. It was. And I'll, I'll start by saying um, the reason that I play drums professionally is because of Paramore. Um, so I started playing drums when I was five, but I started, like, actually taking it seriously when Riot came out. And I, like, basically taught myself how to play drums by learning those songs. Mm -hmm. um, and... I'll I'll say that people are always like, oh, don't meet your heroes. They'll disappoint you. But this was the exact opposite of that. They were like the coolest fucking people on the planet. They were all so nice. Like at, at the first day, I was like, oh, my fiance Mia is coming to the Salt Lake show. And then a week passed in between the shows. And I got there and like Taylor the guitar player was like oh like where's mia and i was like why do you even remember her name remember like why are that's, you are that's, you serious that's awesome. um so they're just like it, it was it was truly like a dream come true uh-huh yeah. yeah it was it was epic yeah no it seemed like uh i mean at a certain point i guess to an extent you can get desensitized to the big rooms mm -hmm. or the big crowds but getting an opportunity like that to not only share a stage with a band you've idolized but actually get a glimpse into knowing them sure. hanging out with them on a tour yeah uh, it seems super cool it was i that was probably my peak uh, I, I mean <laughs> it's hard to beat the uh playing drums to misery business yeah so the f the funny thing about that was uh one day i was just like sitting at catering and you know they were hanging out and i have a philosophy that you know, joke about anything, even if you're being serious, mm -hmm. because you never know what never the answer know. is going to be. Oh, so yeah. I like, I went up to Haley and I was like, I know you guys like bring people out to sing misery business, but have you ever brought anyone out to play drums on misery business? And she was like, oh, actually, like, I don't think that we've ever done that. And I was like, well, you know where to find me, like, come find me. And she's like, why don't we just ask Zach? And we waited like a couple minutes. Zach came over and, and, uh, we were like, can Frankie play drums on Misery Business? And he was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> and then we did it. That's <laughs> yeah. That's insane. It was, so sick. I was so nervous leading up to it, but I was like, you know what song I've probably played the most of any song ever? Misery Business. Mm -hmm. Like I was like a kid, like playing with my eyes closed, envisioning myself like on stage yeah. playing in front of a bunch of people. Manifesting uh, what, what happened years later. Yeah. Would be, uh, the reality of your life. And it was really my my parents were at that show. Mm -hmm. They like flew to Kansas to 
come see me play and I didn't tell them that I was going to do that so mm. out of nowhere I just like walked out and Haley shouted them out and was like oh Frankie's here also her parents came from New York for the show so that, that's unreal it was it was probably top five best days of my life that's that is awesome and yeah. totally deserved like no doubt in my mind that you were going to crush it when I saw that clip <laughs> uh, went up I knew I knew you were going to know it um that that is so cool i still was nervous i was oh, once it was no happening way, uh, i blacked out yeah but i especially once Haley comes up behind you and is uh <laughs> singing like holding your shoulders uh i imagine that's kind of like uh this is is this am i did happening? i die like, like did i die and, like, this is just like yeah, a dream and mia was there right mia there? wasn't there oh, okay. mia missed she went to a show a couple days before that oh, okay, um okay. but she saw the video. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Counts. And I mean, just the the fact that your parents got an experience like that. Exactly. Uh, that's a uh, super. That's super what we validating. do it for, you know. Exactly. It's, it's, it's <laughs> Making the parents them. proud. <laughs> yeah, that that's so cool. Well, uh, yeah, that's just an an amazing year of opportunities. Yeah. Seriously, uh, and you're right back at it in the studio with Max Steel. Hell yeah, brother! Uh, I've been enjoying the clips I've been seeing. Yep. And, uh, you know, maybe I've heard a demo or two here I, or there. I've heard that you've heard a demo or two. <laughs> uh, but uh, how, how's that been going? It's been super fun. Um, we, when we recorded Super Enthusiast leading up to it, um, we, like, booked the studio dates and had about three or four songs written. Mm -hmm. Um and we wrote Lucky for Some like the day before we started recording because we were like, we need an opening track. Like, yep. what are we going to do? Um, but this time around, we were like, you know, our timeline at this point, we've already waited so long. Let's not rush it. Let's spend time and like care writing. Mm -hmm. um, so I moved back to New York from Western Mass. And the apartment I'm living in has a functional basement. So we just set up a little studio um and we're all running through a computer with headphones on so we were we were able to like demo as we were writing so there was no like oh what did i just play and mm -hmm. then it's like gone forever yeah it's already we there. had it like all in the computer That's which dope. was really awesome and no time constraint no time constraint uh you know i i think a time crunch can produce good art but mm -hmm. I also think having time to work on something produces great art. Mm -hmm. um, so the pre not, not having any pressure has been great. Um, but we spent three or four months writing, getting together a couple times a week. Um, and then last week we started officially tracking with Billy Menino at uh, Two Worlds, mm -hmm. um, which is great because it's in New York. It's like 20 minutes from my house. Um we can stay as long as we want. He's a dream. He yeah. rocks at his job. It, it does seem like a cool change of pace from like a, we booked 10 days at this studio. Yeah. We have to come out of these 10 days with exactly. a near finished product too. Yeah. Cole spent an entire day yesterday recording one riff. That, and that's not a joke. That's that serious. <laughs> it, and That's the type of thing that uh, I find hard to believe because when I see what he's capable of, I imagine that he's never had to play a riff more than once in his life. Well, it's life. not, he's not playing the riff. The riff is the same every time, but him and Billy are like, let's try this guitar. Let's uh -huh. try this amp. Let's try like this pedal. It's not, this it's way. not about the performance. No, it's no, no. about the, it's the about, it's about the, uh, nailing the tone. Yeah. And meanwhile, exhaust me and Justin are awesome. sitting there like, they all sound the same, they man. Sound <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if we got the time, yeah, let not? him cook. Exactly. Let him let him pick the perfect tone, uh -huh. you know, and take it from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the longer it takes, the better the value is on recording it. With sure, Andy. yeah. That's where he messed up by saying it could take as long as it takes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, that's, and you already finished your drums. And Justin and I tracked at the same time. We finished in about three and a half days. And okay. I think we did f 14 songs. Okay. Or 12, technically. Um. Yeah, that's dope. Yeah, it was fun. That's gonna be awesome. You're doing great. Uh, do you think I'm doing good? You're okay, doing real cool. good. I'm like uh, trying to remember 
what else? I feel like we're cooking through a lot of these things. I, I should I slow to... down? Should I get into more detail? Um, I don't know. Is there anything you think you'd want to expand on? Anything we kind of went over quick? Um, you haven't played any shows with Chris yet, right? No. Okay, that'll be interesting. Um, we did a lot of rehearsal. Yeah, and you're going to go to the UK with him. Yes. That's coming up? That's the end of August. Okay. Are we start The first show we ever play together is going to be in the UK. That's dope. Yeah. Damn, that's badass. And so you're going to be out with him for like six weeks or something? Yeah, we leave August 27th and we're back October 15th. I feel like that will be a really cool experience of just like touring with one other person who's also like one of your best friends. It rocks. I, I've done a couple tours with him doing merch and TMing. Oh, okay. Um, and we were, this was prior to needing to fit drums, but the tour that I did with him it last October, we were in a Kia Soul, mm -hmm. which was awesome. Because it's like, you don't have to worry about parking a van, no one's smashing windows of a, a Kia Soul, you know, knock on wood. But mm -hmm. it's fun. And it's like touring in a group of seven or eight people, you, you really need to micromanage feelings and, mm. you know, a lot of personalities. Uh, but it just being the two of us, I'm looking forward to like having good vibes all the yeah, time. Absolutely. It yeah. seems like a, a very easy way to just keep spirits high and just like totally sort of feel like a vacation yeah of sorts plus you get to rock waking up with chris in a hotel room he i don't know the name of the song i'll get <laughs> i'll get you the name i think i've seen this clip a time or two <laughs> he his alarm goes off he puts his song on and just starts jumping on my bed that's how i wake that up when i'm insane. on tour with chris so it's like you can't start a day that way and then have a bad day yeah I uh, could definitely see it, it, it's got to be the right personality to be able to pull something like that. Yeah. Off and not because, piss someone off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I could think of numerous situations where if uh, somebody in the band that I was on tour with did that, it would be a potentially a problem. friendship ending. Sure. Um, but yeah, that <laughs> he's just got such a nice smile, uh -huh. you know, you wake up to that and you're like, you know what? Life's not so bad. Yeah. The bits are beginning. Yeah. Another day. That, We're ready to go. That's dope. I um, I always loved how you uh, were so involved in like TMing and stuff outside mm -hmm. of tour also because you had TMed Oso on a couple Manchester times, tour. yeah, and then on another one. Or... I guess technically it was just that one. Yeah, there was one tour I played and on did the merch Citizen tour. Yeah, the one you played. And, yeah. All right, so I imagine if you're in that van, there's only. Uh, the hierarchy of responsible people in that van uh, yep. towards the top. I sure. Would say. Yeah. So, I mean, not intentionally, but I feel like I'm pers just personality. Yeah. Is, like, I think I'm a similar way where even if I'm not a tour manager on a tour, I find myself taking, taking control some, some amount of responsibility yeah. just to get things. Someone has to. Yeah, Otherwise, you'd just be flailing around all day. Uh, um, but yeah, I, I really like TMing. Um, I love making spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. Um very satisfying it's super satisfying Especially as you get to fill in a spreadsheet that oh, you've set up for yourself that's what i'm talking about yeah um but i just i you know i like managing stuff and keeping track of a million different things um and it's a fun way to keep on the road when you're not playing mm -hmm. um so like max deal's been in between records for a little bit and i've been able to like keep on the road just by picking up tm gigs mm -hmm. um so I don't know. That's dope. Selling merch is where it's at, though. It's a yeah. secret. No, I feel like uh, people are starting to realize that the, the tip game uh, as That's a where merch it's person at. is absurd It's these epic. Days. And, um, yeah, a lot of times they could be the person that makes the most money on a tour. A hundred percent. Yeah. So. I did a tour, um, I think it was in November. I was TMing for Slaughter Beach Dog. And merch, like tips alone for merch was probably more money than i've ever made from touring periods That's insane. yeah those kids like to tip uh-huh his fans yeah damn that's it was cool. a great tour when, when, when was that i think it was november it, it was either i think yeah i think it was early november okay yeah damn it was just like a run of rescheduled shows that they had from the beginning of the fall or something like that uh -huh. yeah 
That's sick. Yeah, but if you're looking to get into touring, sell some t-shirts, baby. Sell those shirts. Yeah. Yeah, that is definitely uh, a, a great way to get in. Um, so I, I had forgotten that you had done that Oso tour, mm-hmm. and you and Cole did it, right? Which one? The Citizen one? Yeah. Yeah. The uh, first full U.S. tour I ever did was Oso opening up for Tiny Moving Parts. Oh, okay. so you did two? Oh, okay. Yeah. I did you a... did two and then TM'd? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Damn. So I guess we kind of just missed each other on the Oso train. I think so. Yeah. Um, that's a shame, but we did get to share the stage for the Joe Fist, so. Which is, those songs fucking rock. Yeah. There's I... Corey is one of the best songwriters in the game right now. Absolutely, yeah. I truly think uh, there's something different about that guy's brain. Yeah. And I love it. Yeah. And I have based my most of my working career around it. Sure, so, uh, <laughs> and it's paying off. Yeah, oh, it's paying. It's off. working. Yeah, o- it's just, working out. Yeah, just sent that Joe Fist record in. Uh, yeah, when's that the, coming uh, out? What's the deal with that? We're are you allowed to talk it? about it? Yeah, yeah. I think okay. we can say whatever. Uh, it's done, and the vinyls, the t- test presses are being made right now. I love and it. Corey's finishing up the artwork, and then hopefully it'll be out this year. I think so. I can't wait. Yeah, it's gonna be awesome. It's, I mean, just like the demos he sent, like that we learned for the show that we played last year. Yeah, we're we're good, and it got me excited about the songs. And then playing them live, I was like, "These sound awesome." Yeah, like, you know, uh, actually hearing everything, and then he just did a great job on the recording. Yeah, so. I don't think people know this, but uh, the whole Joe Fist record was actually made twice mm-hmm. because it was made once, and then. Uh, Corey's backpack got stolen and his laptop and his hard drive was in it so he lost the whole record yeah. and then he had to remake it yeah otherwise it probably would have already been out it probably would have yeah yeah and, uh, uh that was definitely tough especially because it was on a joe fist tour yep. <laughs> uh, a little brutal <laughs> yeah but um all things happen for a reason that's what i'm saying i'm sure that he was glad to have another nine months to stress over it yeah um for all so. we know i mean i believe it in my heart the second record variation is better than the first one. Oh yeah. So I, I believe he that. probably bought a new little keyboard that he was able to sneak in there somewhere. Yeah, no doubt in my mind. There's a extra synth knob being turned Hell somewhere. Yeah. Um and so yeah, it'll be it'll be dope. Um but yeah, how was that I guess that tiny moving parts store seemed like it was I, pretty cool at the time sure but uh how was the citizen tour <laughs> the citizen tour was really cool uh angel dust was on it as uh-huh. well um and honey i think maybe. i don't remember maybe i'm thinking of they did two citizen tours so maybe yeah i one. think that's that was the second one that they oh, did yeah. um i don't remember what other bands were on it this was so long ago yeah, at this, this point 2017 yeah maybe 2018, 2018. Yeah. um but that was really fun. That was like the most fit I've ever been on tour because they all exercise so much. Um, so I was like going on Being runs. Citizen. Yeah, not okay. Oso. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> citizen and Angel Dust were doing oh, like yeah, eight hundred totally push-ups amongst the two bands uh-huh. a day, probably more than that. Uh-huh. Um, that but was just I, what you saw. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I was like, not. I wasn't trying to like keep up, but I was like, yeah. oh, this it, is inspiring. inspiring. Yeah. Let me like okay. go on a run or like, you know do one of these or something um but that was fun the, those the, those couple tours that i did with oso were like the first couple of like official tours that i'd ever been a part of mm-hmm. so it was a big like learning game for me um but i i was a fan of oso before playing with them so just playing the shows every night was like fun mm-hmm. you know i don't know is that's that a good fair. answer yeah that was a great answer <laughs> Um, that's exactly what my experience was like. Um, except, uh, J- it was Jade who was running every day um, sure. when I was, when I started touring with them. And so I, it didn't inspire me to run, mm-hmm. but it kind of, I was kind of upset that somebody you were else doing was it. doing yeah. well and I wasn't. <laughs> sure. Um, Fitness on tour is hard because you're tired all the time. You don't want to be doing it. Mm-hmm. And the act of touring itself is physically taxing. So you're like, in the 10 minutes that I'm not doing anything, why would I want to be on a treadmill? Yeah, and also, like, I'm just going to get sweaty, and then what am I going to do? Yeah, especially, like, 
on those tours, you're not staying in hotels. You're staying at your friend's house, your friend of a friend's house. So to not know when your next shower is going to come and then make yourself smell so bad, can't be taking the risk. It's, yeah, it's not ideal. Absolutely not. I did have a really lucky uh, situation when we did the Oso Headliner and we were on the bandwagon. I got mm-hmm. to bring my bike Hell in yeah. the trailer. And so I, I was like biking. You were biking a lot? Uh, I didn't use it that much on the tour because mm-hmm. you just get caught up on tour. But sure. it was cool like waking up at Mahal's. And being like, oh, we don't have to sound check for a few hours. And then, like riding my bike down to like the. That's the dream. Yeah. Whatever that like lake is. Lake yeah. Cleveland. Lakewood something. <laughs> yeah, Lakewood, yeah. <laughs> probably Lake Superior um, or something. Is that Chicago? I think so. It could be around there. Yeah. That makes um, sense. Have yeah. you ever thought about putting Wayne in a backpack and taking him on a bike ride? That would be awesome. Uh, Wayne is petrified of the outdoors. Okay. Um, so he might probably so, wouldn't like it. Yeah. He, he loves to. Uh, long for the outdoors through a window. Sure. But I've even taken him out on my balcony and he is like trying to go to back in. There. He's scared to be out yeah. there. Yeah. And so poor guy. I think it, it's for the best though. It helps me not be afraid that he's going to try to run out the front door. Sure. Um, and yeah, so I'm interested to see just how he develops in his old age. Curious, yeah. He's a curious guy. He wants to know what's going on. But sure. Um, well, maybe the backpack would be good. That's true. Because he'll feel you have secure. A, a backpack that you've taken Basil. I've I do, and he Basil loves it on a bike. Yeah, before. he really loves sticking his head out of the car window, mm-hmm. like when we're driving and stuff. Um, and when I was living in Northampton, I lived right behind a really long bike path. That's so sick. And I got a bike, and I was like, I love this, but I was like, but I miss, I miss my dog. Yeah, and I was like, do you know, he loves being in the car. He probably would love being on a bike. So I bought like a doggy backpack and I would take him on bike rides for like four or five miles. That's and it was just like a beautiful way to spend an evening, yeah. you know? Oh, absolutely. And I'm sure everybody that sees you is like their day is better because yeah. they're seeing. I do think that this. towards the end of last summer, I became a little bit of a local celeb or at least Basil did. Uh-huh. Like I-, I would drive past and then be like, oh, my God, we saw the girl with the dog. Uh-huh. Um, That's awesome. Which was funny. Yeah. Yeah. You should have started an Instagram page. I should have. You never know what kind of platform you could build. You know, I tried to get Basil into like TikTok world, mm-hmm. but it's hard to come up with videos to make. I it was is, like, yeah. I don't, I don't got time for this. Yeah, but yeah. It, is, it is interesting when you see that stuff when it works out. Like, uh, there's that Instagram page. I'm sure you saw this. It's like albums on a dog. Yes. or something. Like, how like did Max that Seal. pop off? And it's like this Instagram page just has like a hundred thousand followers. Yeah, and, and it's then, literally just pictures of a dog yeah, with and, records. With records on it, and so I didn't actually check any analytics to see if if like oh they posted the Maxio record and, and then we got more streams. 40, yeah, <laughs> I mean the streams have been going up. The streams have so, been going up. Unsure uh, what caused them yeah. to, but in the past couple couple weeks they've like gotten like almost 20,000 more plays yeah monthly monthly, monthly plays yeah. yeah um cole was lightly accusing me of hiring like a bot farm <laughs> uh, earlier so did you do it i can't say that i did it but if i did do it i, I would have only been with the best intentions seems suspicious <laughs> <laughs> um yeah not not sure what is has caused yeah. the pop off but we'll take it yeah and if anything it was at least within a month or two of that album being on that dog so actually i never even considered that you're probably yeah, right who knows because thank I you mean, dog thank you yeah, instagram dog i think like, <laughs> I think like ten thousand people like that picture or something that's it's, crazy yeah it's wild um cool i'm trying to think any other high uh, like uh, career highlights that i've missed i feel like uh you know max seal claude chris fair and covers a pretty good amount yeah i mean i don't really know i don't know and then you've got the Chris Farron stuff coming up. Any Max Seal shows that you are legally um, allowed to speak about? There's one, but I don't believe we're legally allowed to okay. speak about but it there yet. there is one. There is one coming up before the year's end. Okay. And it's, uh, will people in the Northeast region be happy to hear about it? No. Okay, cool. <laughs> but That's other people in the United States will be okay. interested to That's hear about cool. it. That's uh, all, all I need to hear because yeah. now I know I'm not going. When is this going to come out? This will probably come out 
this month for sure. August. Okay. Then I probably won't. I can't yeah. probably can't say anything no, about it. That's fair. Um, yeah. But when it goes live, people will be returning to this video and probably commenting about it. A little bit. So. Has anyone ever flipped the script on you? In what way? Asking you questions? Um, yeah. I mean, we only did the one with Ryland. But, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, when we did it, it was kind of like I framed it like uh, in a way where I was telling him to interview me before it. Okay. Because I was like, let's do an interview about you putting out The Brightest Days, mm. like their, the new Origami album, and also it being Counterintuitive's 100th release. Got it. So it was like... So it was double duty interview. Yeah, yeah. It was sort of like uh, with the pretense of being like, talk about this album, and then him being like, talk about uh, putting out 100 albums or whatever. So, sure. Uh, but I, yeah, I felt like uh, it's not as sustainable to... Just ask people like, okay, so I'm going to interview you, but you are also going to interview me. It seems <laughs> well, a little like... Uh... I just mean, if not for this, but uh-huh. at some point, if you're going to keep doing this, you got to get someone to interview you. Yeah. Oh, well, actually, I guess this could be a good plug. Uh, it'll probably already be out by the time this that we release this because it'll take a few days. But on Wednesday, uh, so like five days or something, mm-hmm. ABC News... Did a feature okay. on Counterintuitive. Let's go. They have this program, Chronicle, that they've been doing for like 45 years where they just like highlight local people or businesses mm-hmm. or whatever, and they're doing a behind-the-label feature. So wow. So they did an episode with like an uh, indie fashion label. Okay. And an episode where they like uh, interviewed somebody who makes art for beer can labels. Okay. And then they found a Boston-based record label. Is it going to be on TV? It's going to be on ABC News Channel 5 uh, on, like, Wednesday, April, or August 9th, I think. Uh, Hell yeah. And um, so they came to the apartment, interviewed me and Dan, like, Mm -hmm. uh, CIA's label manager, for, like, a half hour. And then they were in this room. They had us at this desk pretending to work (laughs) for B-roll. And then we laid out a bunch of records, and they took... uh, just a ton of B-roll of, like, records. That's and awesome. I sent them a ton of clips. They mm-hmm. asked for, like, just stuff. So I sent them the Max deal at the shop. Uh, at the Iconic shop. gig. And Iconic so I, gig. Maybe you'll be on ABC News. Uh, I'll tune in. Hitting the fill um, in a few days. I uh, do. I want to tell you something, Jake. Uh-huh. I've, at this point, played a lot of shows. Played a lot of big shows. Mm-hmm. That was still my favorite show I've ever played in my entire life. That's awesome. That was like, sometimes I think about it and I still get fucking chills. Yeah, I, I feel like I was at the show tonight. I was thinking like, I mean, anytime you play the Sinclair, it's awesome. It's an mm-hmm. awesome venue, but it's not like opening a show is not going to have the magic of headlining a DIY show in an auto, auto shop. shop. Yeah. 200 kids there, Cadence climbing into the rafters. <laughs> and then I truly feel like people seeing Cadence. It like let everybody go from just like enjoying the show to like having the best night of their lives in the moment. Yeah. To the point where like the reaction for the rest of it is like, I mean, the video speaks for itself. Yeah. And it's a a super fond memory. Yeah. Um, And shout out Sana for putting it on on those shows. Yeah. Yeah. Queen. Um, But uh, yeah. So uh, I also agree. That was like one of my favorite show memories. And Mm -hmm. I didn't even get to be the one playing it. I would love to play a show like that again. Yeah, I I really would would like to do more stuff like that. So yeah, that would definitely be sick. Um, but yeah, I sent them. I sent ABC News a bunch of clips like that, and just like photos of my old bedroom when I had the office all the boxes. with all the records <laughs> stacked up, and yeah. uh, when we were packing records on the porch, and like a thousand Origami Angel records, dude, being boxed up on the porch. And I stuff, remember so. walking into your apartment building, and there being like dozens of boxes the, not uh, even in your apartment yeah, in the in building the, yeah. and i'm like how is your landlord cool with this I, the, I can't believe nobody ever mentioned it and yeah. luckily like over covid we made friends with our upstairs neighbor sure and so she was totally chill she's like a great friend of mine now and so she never cared about like i love that 200 records waiting sitting in the around foyer, yeah. in, like, the downstairs <laughs> foyer to be picked up by the post office that's um, awesome. The fact dude. the landlord never said anything is insane. Yeah. Because you take one look at that and you're like, you can't be running a business. Out That's of not it. allowed. I, I feel like you're in, it's kind of a gray area. But if they looked it up, it, they would have seen their address for the Everywhere. house they own on, not only on all the records, but on all the paperwork yeah. for the, the label <laughs> and stuff. So 
thankfully that uh that is a thing of the past you fake it till um, you make it yeah now you don't have to do it anymore yep um and so i'm interested to see how they frame the interview uh because mm-hmm. it's like a three minute segment okay we're here that's for- a long time for like a tv a long- segment yeah, yeah and so i'm really excited to see it and i hope i don't look dumb because there was plenty of answers where i was like i sound dumb right now <laughs> as i'm responding but i mean part out. yeah yeah i'm i um, bet it's gonna be awesome i i, I think so too and it's just cool to get an opportunity like that where it's um something more for the old heads Mm -hmm. where like i told my parents about it and my mom was like i've watched that program every night for 20 years well and so it's like you do it for the parents you do it for the parents and the idea of like just people from the town i grew up in just Mm -hmm. like watching the news and being like we know that kid yeah he went to school with my i can't believe he made it yeah yeah like uh so i think that'll be a cool validation sure um that uh it also is gonna expose the label and then because of that the bands to a whole group of people that would have never crossed their path absolutely yeah which is awesome i hope that there's some tangible result of that i don't know if this is if the local news audience is the exact uh, i don't know there might be it's going to spotify or youtube (laughs) afterwards but the next p daddy gig is going to be like a bunch of old geezers (laughs) hey if they buy tickets they're welcome at the show that's what i'm saying those ticket counts to go up yeah uh by any means necessary sure um i love an old guy at a gig that's just like standing in the back like vibing out yeah kind of thinking about like days gone by but also enjoying the moment yeah um yeah no there's nothing nothing but respect for anybody getting out to the gig because it. it's the last thing i want to do most of the time <laughs> and so i appreciate that others do want yeah do it. it is funny you know i had this moment a couple uh months ago where i was talking to me and i was like i wish that i wasn't doing music so i could just go to a show and like have a good time but it's like impossible I mean, I'm trying to not make it feel this way, but it's impossible to go to a show and not feel like you're at work. Yeah. Um, so, you know, now that I'm in Brooklyn, I'm trying to just like, even if there's a show going on down the street, I don't know the bands. I'm just going to drop in, see what's going on. That's cool. Don't know anyone. That's just try good, and like re fall in love with like getting into the gig. To try to get into. Yeah. It's, it's hard. I feel like, especially with like, uh, like something like tonight where if we weren't recording this interview and I was just going to see, Maxiel open up for Piebald and the movie life. Like realistically, I've only listened to Maxiel out of those three bands and mm-hmm. I'd be like, Oh, I'm just going to leave right after Maxiel. Yeah. Cause I'm just so tired of being in a venue yeah. and, uh, and just watching another live set Yeah, because it just is draining and it's depressing because that used to be my favorite thing. I know. So. That's why I'm like trying to get myself to love it again mm-hmm. because it's like the reason that I'm doing this is because I love music yeah realistically like yeah so now i just got to remember how yeah remember how to do that um Um, i I recently actually had i went to uh boston calling mm -hmm. and saw queens of the stone age and paramore okay it was the first like couple sets in a while where i was like that was actually just fun for like an hour straight yeah like i had the same um i i saw paramore at msg in june Mm. I think it was. Was it before or after the tour? It was after the tour. Were you on the guest list? I was on the guest list, oh, that's which so dope. also one that's of the coolest things. So you know, I could sick. just text someone and be like, "Hey, you got any extra spots?" And you were on the Paramore guest. List. I was on the Paramore that's guest so list. Sick. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, because it's also not that I like I'm gonna take it for granted, but it's kind of awesome to be like I never have to worry about buying a ticket to see Paramore. Probably, yeah. I can probably figure it out one way or another. Mm. Um, but. Mia's favorite band is also Paramore. Like, it was one of the things we bonded about for the first time. Um, And the two of us went, and it was like I wasn't working. I didn't have to be playing. I didn't have to go do merch. I didn't have to go settle the show. And we just, like, watched our favorite band together. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is why you do it. Yeah. You know? This is awesome. This rocks. This is what everyone's doing when they're at my show. Yeah. At a show I'm playing or something. Exactly. Yeah. But. That's, That's dope. Uh, yeah, I mean, going going to shows is hard, but sometimes you just got to get a grip and go and have fun. Well said. Suck it up. Yeah. Get to the gig. Yeah, I, I will say when um, I saw you open for Phoebe, and there's a line probably 
a hundred people long to mm-hmm. get through security. Sure. And I'm walking up to that box office that says guest list on the side, and every single person in that just line looking is at like, you. does this person know me? <laughs> and I'm just like, yes, I do. Technically, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's a good feeling. That's that is so yeah. sick. Um, I I that show was fun, also because. I saw you. I was going to say, do you remember the moment? When yeah. We, having, cause I love, we didn't even get to talk. No, that, night that was the was only moment we show. had that yeah. whole, that whole night. Mm-hmm. But I really like making eye contact with people when I'm on stage. I know some people are like, Oh, I could never like, I just have to like space out and not think mm-hmm. about there being people. But I love like making eye contact with someone singing the lyrics or like just seeing people having a good time. And I was like, I know Jake is here. I'm going to try and find yeah. him in the sea of 12, in the sea fans. of 12,000 people. Um, and I, there, it, it must've been in between songs because I no, waved was, back at you. Um, I, I think it was during a song and you weren't playing that part. And I waved it, but at you. I was, I, I don't, I couldn't even tell you how many people are in Claude. Cause I was only watching you <laughs> the entire set because I'm like, it's fucking Frankie up there. <laughs> and so I'm just like religiously watching you and I see you scanning the crowd and I'm like, you're going to see me. Yeah. And so I just hit you with the point. I mean, I was looking for you. Yeah. And, yeah. And so you saw and pointed back and people around me were like, she's pointed at you. And you're so, like, yeah, that's yeah, Frankie motherfucker. That's Frankie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, that's why I'm like, especially with people that I know have been like, coming up through diy i like love those moments where you're like we're fucking doing it bro yeah are you seeing are you seeing this like look at us go yeah i yeah it was i mean i i felt a sense of pride watching you Mm -hmm. get to do that so i can only imagine getting to do that billy keeps saying which i'm not gonna i'm not gonna own this because it was billy saying it but billy keeps saying that the misery business moment was a win for everyone in DIY. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I'm like, I feel like I can't say that because it's like it happened to me. But I'm like, uh-huh. this just goes to show you. You pay your dues. You play your shitty gigs. And eventually, maybe you'll end up on stage with Paramore. Yeah. yeah. You also just have to be uh, one of the most elite uh technically proficient musicians uh, out there. I but mean. That comes through the hard work and pain. Yeah. I don't think that. I don't think I ended up on the Claude gig because I'm good at drums. Mm-hmm. I think that, and I'm, I I really believe this. Obviously it matters to be good at your instrument, mm-hmm. but you can learn how to play an instrument. You have to be fucking cool. Yeah. And like, if you're not fun to be around people. Yeah. If, you if you're going to be a pain in the ass, you're not going to be asked back on tour. So yeah. you need, if, if you want a tour, you got to learn how to chill. Yeah. And like, be a nice person yeah. ultimately so before you pick up a guitar or drums or anything just work on the vibe work on the vibe Get learn that. how to say please uh-huh. learn how to say thank you yeah. you know be grateful for what you got and don't uh-huh. don't take it for granted i don't know i feel like someone gave me that advice once and i was like you know what don't be stuck up don't be a pain in the ass and you'll keep getting work yeah yeah i mean i feel like uh, i'm a prime example of that because I am from the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, <laughs> where like you're like a Berkeley trained like mm-hmm. drummer, like and obviously you're fun to hang around, sure. And so it's dope <laughs> that you have the skills to back it up. Mm. And then I bought my first bass when I was like 24 and sure. was leaving for a Pictures of Vernon tour the next week. Yeah, and, and now you're gonna be playing bass in fucking Japan. Yeah, yeah, and. And I don't feel like I have the technical ability to do it, but I'm fun enough to be around that people yeah. keep. I'll say uh, you got a killer stage that. presence. I, so I feel like if I'm having fun up there, people don't care about the mistakes as much. You're right. Uh, and I said this to Justin today, but I said, um, so we played two new songs today, mm-hmm. and I was like, you know, people don't realize that you mess up unless you mess up the first note of a song. Mm-hmm. So just. Play the first note right, and then you're going to be... No one is going to realize if you mess up any time else in the song. That is... I'd say for the most part, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with, like, a melodic instrument. Drums are harder because if you really mess up bad, it's easy for people to realize if you mess up on drums. Um, But, yeah. I I think with bass, people kind of only notice it if you mess up. Sure. But it's got to be pretty blatant. And thankfully, it's easy enough to 
fake it through the mistakes. Yeah. I mean, uh, what? You got four notes up there? Uh, yeah. It's really not too much <laughs> to worry about. That's why I went for it. It was the... Yeah. The, the you know, easiest. you bought me a bass, actually. That's true. Oh, yeah. That, and I, that was really, I play it sometimes. That was a... Uh, that was a really special day. I was actually thinking about bringing that up yeah. because uh, it meant a lot to me that you and Mia made me Valentine's Day cupcakes oh. that year. That meant a lot to me. Yeah. Cool. I, I, so I was like during COVID, obviously I couldn't do anything and I was living in an apartment in Boston. I didn't even have my drums with me when everything got shut down. They were in New York and I was like, what can I do? And then I think I tweeted something that was just like, wouldn't it be so sick if I learned how to play bass? And it felt like, the next day you were like, there's one on the way to your apartment. Mm -hmm. That that was a special time. It was like the most baller thing anyone has I, ever done. I, I was, I was definitely, uh, I, I had a few of those moments because I was able to get instruments for a lot of people. And yeah. it definitely felt really good because one, getting the Fender deal to begin with mm -hmm. is awesome. Cause sure. it's just like a validation. Like, Oh, they think what we're doing is legit enough. They want to work with us. Yeah. And then, just like there's so many artists that I feel like have given me so much by just not only like working with the label where we're collectively earning money together, but mm -hmm. also just like being my friends. And so it was awesome that when COVID hit and like since no bands are going on tour, people that love music wanted to support music. And so they turned to web stores. Sure. So it was like that was by far... 10 times more people buying records than it ever. Wow. Had. So it was like it's kind of the opposite of a problem to have at opposite. that time. Yeah. yeah. Like the, the problem was that all the bands weren't getting to do their tours. Yeah. And so it was like, will these bands all break up? Like, are they going to be able to continue? But the upside was everything on our web store selling out because mm -hmm. everyone wants to buy records. And then, uh, so it just happened to be at the same time that the Fender deal happened. And so it was like, anyone on the label that even hinted at wanting something it was like they got it i can get you a 750 fifty dollar base for like 200 bucks yeah like, that's awesome and like yeah it's like that's and for all you know they're writing new hits on that guitar exactly and i'm just earning some goodwill in the process yeah and so uh um yeah i think the one that i have is the squire version of uh, your bass i think, I think so, it's yeah. the same coloring and stuff uh -huh. it's a good look it, look it looks great. great on my wall. Yeah, I, I will say I don't take it down very often at this point. Uh -huh. But I was I was definitely learning some like cool Teen and Sarah riffs. I learned uh, a Harry Styles I, I song. A clips, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it was, I was fun glad to get to contribute to your musical journey. Yeah, and I had never played a melodic instrument before either. So even just like, like, it was fun because after like a certain amount of time. I don't think that you can ever stop learning something, but mm. at a certain amount of time, you kind of run out of things that you're like, oh, that's something that I want to learn how to do. Yeah. But with an entirely new instrument, it kind of like revived my like want to learn. Yeah. You could go back to songs that you'd learn. Exactly. 20 years ago on drums and be like, oh, now, now I can play it on bass. Yeah. yeah. But it was like, I was like learning these songs on bass and then by learning them, in a different instrumentation it made me realize like what was going on on drums mm -hmm. and then i can like it made me rethink how i even play drums mm -hmm. which was just kind of cool how, like some rhythms match up and yeah. stuff like that yeah it's like it made crazy. me really conscious of my kick kick pedal wow. rhythms because usually i'm just like oh wherever it lands that's where it lands but learning bass parts you know obviously like, huh, every single hit is on a kick yeah who would have thought yeah you know, I, I had a similar like a uh, like in a classic case of faking it till you make it like mm -hmm. I, practicing for an Oso tour. I don't remember which one, but there were plenty of them that were opportunities that I felt like I didn't deserve to be sure. playing rooms I didn't deserve and like practicing and Jade making comment like, oh, that rhythm is supposed to match up with the bass drum. And I'm mm. like, that's such a cool idea. Yeah, I never would have thought of doing that. <laughs> like you invented that. Like, uh, yeah. And just like. uh just being really impressed that he sees music in a way that I can't even envision yeah. where I feel like he has one of those brains that sees the entire song at once mm -hmm. and can kind of like, like we would do a practice and we would run through a song and afterwards he would be, if there was notes on like people like playing something wrong, he could remember each person. Everyone's 
from yeah. one playthrough. I'm like, dude, they're happening at the same time. How do you keep track? How do you know? But that's wild. Like he's similar to Corey in that way of just having like a really good vision of, mm-hmm. uh, of full, uh, just how a full song works. Yeah, some people are like that. Yeah, I'm not one of those people. Yeah, me neither. I uh, I don't really know much about uh. I know songs. what numbers the frets are. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's about yeah, it. I feel like it should be inspiring to people that want to play. I mean, yeah. You really don't need to know anything. You don't. What the frets are. You don't need to know anything. You need to know that usually snare hits on two and four and kick fills in in between that. Uh huh. That's how you play drums. Match that bass to the, yeah. to the kick. That's it. All of a sudden, the song's done. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. We could write a song. We should write a song. I'm kind of getting the feeling Let's we write, a, write song. a song. We got we got a couple hours till the guys yeah, get oh here. Yeah. I mean, and we're already <laughs> oh, we're we're pushing an hour right now. Let's go. Now, I thought we were at one point. I was like, oh, this thing might be like twenty five minutes, <laughs> but uh, I think we fell into a nice groove, and uh, we killed it. Yeah, we killed it. I feel like this is probably a great, great spot. We to should just stop. Say, we should stop we've talking. Done we've, we've done it. We've done it. all. We we've said everything that could be said. There's nothing else to talk yeah, about. Yeah, and uh, we've covered all the possible ground. And now so. we just got to go out there into the world. Let people listen. Let people listen. And then in the meantime, just live a bunch more experiences that we can discuss next time. Next time. Hell yeah. I love it. Does your podcast, I mean, does your uh, thing that we're doing right now have a name? Uh, it does not. No, I've been trying to think of, should it have a name? Like, mm-hmm. uh, How official are you trying to get? I, I don't think it needs to be that official. I feel okay. like I would only get official if I saw some dollar signs coming in and was sure. Like, That's okay. a good reason to get official. It seems like a lot of people that do those types of uh, programming uh-huh. uh, <laughs> uh, make a lot of money. And Definitely. So, uh, I don't see you this. put one like fucking better help clip in there. And you got like a hundred grand. Yeah. And <laughs> so uh, currently we don't have any of those sponsors yet, but. But by the time those sponsors do start coming around with those big checks, then maybe uh, this will be a little more official. I was thinking of a name, though, mm-hmm. but I just don't know if it's going to need one. Okay. Uh, or I had an idea earlier that it was, I would call it, it's not a podcast, comma, I'm normal. I mean, I love that. And so... Featuring Tobo Chico. Featuring... <laughs> <laughs> Promoted, brought to you brought by... Brought to you by <laughs> <laughs> TD Bank <laughs> and Tobo Chico. Love it. Um, but... I don't, I don't know. I'll ruminate on it. And then maybe next time you're in here, it'll be episode 18, 18 of the something, something, uh, interview series. I love it. Hell yeah. All right. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Jake. It's been a pleasure. You're an icon. Uh, thank you. Likewise. <laughs> uh, everybody's got to go listen to the new Chris Farron record. Check it out. It's on the internet. It's on the web and check them out on tour. We're coming uh, to a city near you, yeah, probably. I don't know if they have YouTube in England and uh, Europe. Is Europe over- just the UK? Yeah, if they have it in the UK, but if you've got YouTube over there and you're seeing this, Chris Farron featuring Frankie, check it Let's out. Let's go. All right. I think we did good. We did good. I think we did pretty you think good. Think that yeah. was good enough? I I think that was awesome. Yeah. What do you My think? My answers okay. I thought they were great. Yeah. Do I hit stop or do I hit record? I stop. <laughs>